Hello. So, in this video, we are aiming to develop a rule to take derivatives of polynomials. So, we've seen um, sort of earlier that we could sort of split them apart in some way uh, using sums and differences and using constant multiples. So, really, what we're after is we want to be able to do the x to the n part of the polynomial or really of a monomial, right? So, um, the goal here is that we, we really want to sort of avoid the difference quotient. So we're trying to come up with a rule that works for sort of immediately telling us what the derivative of x to the n is without having to run it through all of that difference quotient machinery, okay? So usually when you're trying to develop these rules, you just want to start by writing out what you want to compute, right? So we know we need to use the difference quotient, right? That's the definition of the derivative. So we're just going to plug in what that x to the n would look like, right? So if my function is x to the n, this is the basic form of a difference quotient, then I'm going to go ahead and plug it in so that I get, right, that x plus delta x to the n minus x to the n all over delta x as delta x goes to zero. Okay, so we have that. Now what? <laughs> right, so like... If I knew what n was, like if n were 2, then I would be like, okay, you know, I'm squaring this thing, so I'm just going to multiply it all out, collect all my like terms together, and then see if I could simplify things down. But the whole point of this exercise is that we don't know what n is, right? We want a general form, something that works for any x to the n. So I can't assume that n is 2, because then I've only solved this for when n is 2, right? That That's not, I mean, that is a little helpful, but it's not really what I'm after here, right? So to actually get at this, we're, we sort of actually need a much more advanced tool, something called the binomial expansion theorem. So the actual binomial expansion theorem is sort of outside the scope of this course, but what we're going to try to do is develop sort of an understanding or, or an intuitive idea of what this thing is telling us, at least in terms of the stuff that we need to know or use in it. Um, so just as a sort of warning, if you go out and try to look up the binomial expansion theorem, it's going to have all kinds of notation and results and stuff that is like complete gibberish because it is a very uh, more, it, it's a much more advanced theorem than what we are going to use here because we only need sort of a very small piece of it to do what we want to do. Okay, so to do this, we want to sort of think about what it means to expand this thing, right? So our goal is to sort of write out what this thing is without knowing what n is, which seems like a lofty goal, right? Because we don't even know sort of how many times to write this thing. But to start, remember what it is to have a, a positive integer power. We want to write this thing as that base, the x plus delta x times itself n times, right? So when trying to sort of expand this thing out, right, if we were trying to FOIL or use the distributive property to, to sort of fully expand this thing out, one way you can think about this is by looking at each of these terms, right, each of these uh, x plus delta x pieces and choosing one of them from each pair to multiply together and getting a term as a result. And the full expansion is doing that with every possible combination, okay? So this is a little weird to just sort of say, so let's sort of maybe look at a concrete example of this thing. So let's look at, in particular, if n were three. And again, the whole point is we don't know what n is, so I'm using this sort of as a explanation tool, but the things that we're gonna pull out of this apply for n in general, not just for when it's three. So, if I think about, right, looking at these colors, so keep track of the color, they're there for, you know, good reason. <laughs> so uh, my claim is, is that I can get the full expansion of this thing, right? I can, I can expand out all of this fully by choosing one from each of these pairings and multiplying it together and making sure I get every combination possible and adding those all up. So if I do that, I get this whole big mess. Okay. So... We're going to go through this sort of piece by piece, but 
if I were to do that, right, and get all of this stuff and then combine like terms, right? So instead of writing it as something like x times x times delta x, I would write that as x squared times delta x. I would combine all my like terms and eventually get something that looks like this, okay? So going back to the idea of selecting piece by piece. So let's sort of look at some of this stuff here. If I were to choose the x in the first piece, the x in the second piece, and the x in the third piece and multiply them all together, I get this x times x times x, right? If I were to look at the x in the first piece, right, choose the first x, the x in the second piece, but the delta x in the third piece, then I would get this second term, right? If I were to choose the x in the first piece, the delta x in the second piece, the x in the third piece, that's how I would get this piece, right? So when I say that I'm choosing one from each, this is what I mean, is that I'm like, okay, I can choose one of those two, so I'll choose the x first. I can choose one of these, I'll choose the x again. I can choose one of these, I'll choose the x again. That's how I get the first piece. But then I've already done all of the x's, so then I need to have not an x somewhere. So I choose x, then x, but then delta x, so that I have a different thing. That's how I got the second one, right? And I would go through this for every possible combination. That's how I get all of these pieces. Okay. So explanation of how that you know mechanically works aside, how is this useful? Okay, so there's a few things I want to sort of pull out of this. So the first one is, is that there's really only one time where I have only x's because this corresponds to taking, right, the x in the first piece, oops, hit the wrong button, sorry, x in the first piece, x in the second piece, and x in the third piece. So there's only one possible way to get only x's, because if I didn't choose x in one of these, then I'd have a delta x factor, right? So the only way to have none is to have only x's. So this is going to be important. There's one thing that's just x. Likewise, there's only sort of an n number of ways. So in our sort of example with three, there's uh, three ways that we can get one delta x factor, which corresponds to like, okay, if I choose delta x here, then I can only choose x's from there on out. Otherwise, I'd have too many delta x's, right? So I could choose one there, but then I know all the rest have to be x's. I could choose this one, but then I know all the rest have to be x's. Or I could choose this one, all the rest would have to be x's, okay? So that corresponds to these three pieces, right? So here, that's where I chose the first one, that's where I chose the second one, this is where I chose the third one. And there's only these three possibilities when I'm doing n equals three. But in general, right, if I had n of these factors multiplied together, then I would have n pieces to choose that delta x and all the rest would be fixed. So if I have n terms, then there's going to be n of these pieces that have delta x as, you know, one factor and all the rest are x's. I also want to make note here that if I have delta x as a single factor, all the other factors have to be x, that means that there is sort of x, there's this n minus one number of those things, right? Because there's n total, I chose delta x as one of them, all the rest have to be x's, so those x's are n minus one, right? There's n in total, all but one have to be x. Which, um, again, just to be maybe clear, go back here a second, um, to be clear, that is saying that, you know, if n is three, that means that I have an x equals, right? I have uh, a square for the x's here, right? So I have two x's because I have n being in three in this case, all but one, so two, have to be x. The last one is delta x, uh, to be clear what I'm saying. Finally, the, thing I, the last thing I want to sort of make note of is that everything else has to have at least two delta x's, which, again, sort of intuitively makes sense because I've dealt with all x's, meaning there's no delta x, and all cases where there's one delta x. So all that's left is where there are two or more delta x factors, okay? All right. So I know that was a lot to digest, <laughs> but it turns out that this is actually going to be sort of all we need out of that. Um, 
So if we expand this out, sort of as a summary here, if we expand this out for some generic n, this tells us that we're going to get a single x to the n term, because it's that one where we choose only x's. We're going to get n terms that look like x to the n minus 1 times delta x, because again, we're choosing that delta x once from each of those n pieces, and everything else is just the x term, which gets us x to the n minus 1. And all the rest of the factors are going to have at least two delta x's, meaning that they'll have some sort of uh, delta x squared. So that means that when we write this out, right, this thing, I can look at it as an x to the n term, n x to the n minus 1 terms times delta x, and then I can factor out this delta x squared, right, the two factors that are in everything else. And all of that everything else is just, you know, it's a bunch of stuff, but it turns out I'm not going to care what they are. There's just a bunch of other stuff, okay? All right. <laughs> so now for all of the fun algebra part, right? Like we haven't done enough of that yet, but again, bear with me. We'll come to a pretty nice result by the end of this. So again, I'm looking at where I started before, right? I have the general difference quotient and I substitute in that x to the n piece, right? Now I can do that expansion by using that binomial expansion-esque argument that we just made. So I'm replacing that x to the delta n, uh, x plus delta x to the n by x to the n plus n x to the n minus 1 times delta x plus delta x squared times whatever the leftovers are. And then this x to the, minus x to the n is just from that original, right? That's this piece as is the, the delta x in the bottom, okay? Now I can combine those, right? I have a positive x to the n here. I have a negative x to the n there. I can cancel those out. So that just leaves me this middle piece. And those both have delta x in them, so I can factor that out, right? So and then I have, I pull out the delta x from this term and from that term, leaving me with just n x to the n minus 1 and delta x times whatever was left over. And now I have a delta x in the top multiplying everything and that delta x in the bottom, so I can cancel that out. And here's why I didn't care what the leftover terms were, because the one thing I do know about it is that they're bounded. There's some num it's some number that's over there. And importantly, delta x is going to zero. So when delta x goes to zero, whatever this number is, it just gets nuked by that piece going to zero. It goes to zero, right? This whole thing gets kind of eliminated. <laughs> Believe it or not, the actual mathematical term for this is annihilated, which I think is awesome, but that's a side note. So that is just going to leave us with that first piece left over, this nx to the n minus 1, and that is our end result. Okay, so what does this tell us, right? There's a lot of algebra and alphabet soup getting thrown at us here. So generally speaking, if we are given some x to the n term, right, some monomial, piece of a polynomial, then we've determined that the derivative is this, through a lot of effort, admittedly, but it's this relatively nice thing, we can just immediately tell that the derivative is n times x to the n minus 1, okay? So now we don't actually have to do the quotient rule for x to the n because we know what that's going to be at the end, right? We can sort of just immediately use this nice rule. Um, this is sometimes called the power rule, depending on who you're sort of talking to, or a polynomial rule. Uh, just to be clear, look at an example here. So if I were to give you, you know, if you were to have something like x to the 10, to do the derivative, you don't have to go through the whole long, you know, uh, difference quotient piece to get through it all, which would be a nightmare, right? Because you'd be expanding something to the 10th power, right? That would be some huge thing to do. Instead, we can apply this power rule or polynomial rule and we just sort of drop, it's usually referred to as dropping that 10 in front and subtracting one, right? So that it's, it's the power uh, that you started with, multiply and then subtract one from that thing, okay? Now, to be clear, the argument that we've made, technically speaking, only applies when n is a non-negative integer. But it turns out this rule is much more general than that. In fact, any kind of real number that's finite, um, including like irrational values like pi or square root of 2, 
this rule still works. So if you add x to the square root of two, its derivative would be square root of two times x to the square root of two minus one, right? So even though we've strictly speaking only proven it for positive or non-negative integers, um, it's much more broad than that. And doing that level of proof is well beyond the scope of this course. So we're not gonna sort of jump in. We'll just take it as a given, okay? All right, so what have we learned? So if we're given a general function, x to the n, we now know the derivative is going to be just n x to the n minus one. And this is sort of really nice because we can bypass all of that uh, difference quotient and all of the craziness that would come with expanding very large powers of n, even assuming we could, right? Because if you had something like x to the square root of two, there's no nice way of expanding that, right? So there would be no way of really doing the difference quotient uh, at that point, or at least no obvious way. So we use then this idea of the derivative uh, to sort of do this more generally. So now we have our, our final rule that we can use for monomials. And it turns out uh, as sort of a side note that this is going to be coming up a lot more than you might think when we introduce the chain rule. So when we get that far, um, the chain rule is going to sort of make using this particular rule very handy. And we'll see lots of examples of where that comes in. Okay, so that is that.